Hey everyone, it's April 23, 2017, and this is your episode 94 of At Percussion. My name is Casey Cangelosi, and with me are my co-hosts Laurel Black. Hi. And Megan Arns. Hello. Brandon Arves here, stepping in for Ben Charles. How's it going, Brandon? I'm doing pretty well. How are you guys? Just fine, you guys. I just got done hearing my students play Petrushka with our orchestra. Nice. It was so fun. I was so happy to hear everything and just everything done well. And yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's scary when you hear a piece that you you really care about and this you're, you have so many (laughs) opinions about, and then, you know, and in a way, even though they're all good and. The group's yeah. good and everything. You expect it's gonna, you expect to not like it because it's so dear to you. And then when you do end up liking it, it just feels really good. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's good. Is that your new orchestra director? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, Mr. Foster Byers. Yeah. Cool. It's nice. cool. So I ran over here from there. But listen, our guest today is a doctoral candidate at the University of North Texas. You might have heard of that school for percussionists. Mm-hmm. Prior to that, he was a school buddy of Laurel's at the Boston Conservatory, where he received his master's degree. He's an adjunct instructor of music at Texas Women's University. He's a very busy performer as the principal percussionist for the, oh boy, you got to help me with this, Jacob. Tex Arcana. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good. Tex go. Arcana Symphony Orchestra. Te- te- tex Arcana. <laughs> oh, like <okay>. Texas? <laughs> tex That's Arcana. okay, man. <laughs> Home Scott Joplin, right? Birthplace of Scott Joplin. And uh, I just learned um, Conlon Nantaro was. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh wow. yeah, yeah. yeah. Crazy. And, really? Huh? That's and where both from? Yeah, yeah, crazy. There's some. There's something in the water up there. From there. And um, Tony Edwards, down from UT, I hear is from Texarkana as well. So am I the only uh, one who looked at that word and was like, "What the hell is that?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, it, it's no. it's it's on the border of Texas and Arkansas, so it's kind of it's got like two mayors. It's one of those cities that has two municipalities and you know whatnot. It's it's a nice it's those. nice little twin cities yeah, dynamic. So this sounds like a sitcom waiting to happen. Uh, yeah, no, called yeah. Twin Municipality. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Jacob, do you live there? No, 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 no. That's uh, it's a uh, you know we play about seven concerts a year. Um, it's part of you know um, we just wrapped up. We had our season finale uh, last night. Um, but I also play out in Midland, Odessa, um, in West Texas now, and then I sub with a couple of other groups around the state. Um, you know, just every now and then I'll step in with uh, Dallas Winds. I'll drive out to Little Rock, play with the Arkansas Symphony, um, and then I'll. Um, there's a there's an orchestra here in town called the uh, Las Colinas Symphony. They uh, play in different parts of the, the DFW. They play in Arlington, Irving, and in Garland. I'll play. Uh, let me see. Well, maybe missing somebody. But uh, yeah, that's kind of fills out my my season schedule for at least it has been the past uh, past couple of years. You know, next year. Hopefully it will be the same. Hopefully I can, you know, I've got my contracted work with those two groups, and um, you know, I'll get to fill out the rest of the season with the with these other work, uh, with other jobs and whatnot. So yeah, awesome, cool. I had all of that written down, but you finished it for me. Oh, oh snap! <laughs> Did I? Oh man, I missed uh, the grand <laughs> intro, right? Did I totally just? I think it's off? better this way. I think I was well. now. Yeah, that was. I was waiting for it. I was waiting for it, man. I hear you. I, you know, you introduce all. I'm scared. I'm scared. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. That way, Jake, <laughs> what kind of like driving radius is all of that for you? Man, that's a good question. So you know, like uh, that's that's the typical, uh, I guess, commuting lifestyle for. I mean, um, there are a lot of players like myself that that you know, that kind of work like that. So they drive many miles. Um, fortunately, DFW is kind of uh, midway between like at least the furthest drive that I do is it's Little Rock, which is about five hours. Um, due east and Midland is about the same due west. Um, Texas Canada is about halfway. It's about two hour, two and a half. And Abilene, Ab- Abilene Philharmonic is about two and a half west. So, I mean, driving from the, around the DFW itself is uh, pretty, pretty taxing already on your vehicle. I mean, I also, in addition to all that, I teach on three different. You know, so I teach at TWU. 
in addition to teach at, uh, I'll teach at uh, two independent school districts, um, two high schools, and so I drive around quite a bit there. But I just recently got a new car, so I'm quickly putting the miles on that on that uh, on the on the Rav Four there. And um, so yeah, I used to have a, a Forerunner. Um, mm. I don't know, Laurel. Do you remember that? Do you, Do you remember the the green truck that I had? I don't know if we could. I don't. Did you have it in Boston? I don't think I. I, I had it. I had it in Boston. Um, I mean, I that was one of the main reasons why I, I got a lot of work while I was there because I was the only one with the car, and so uh, I could. Yeah. <laughs> so I could go out and you know um, and uh, you know I had those opportunities. But yeah, I took that truck up with me to Boston. Um, yeah, I love that car. Um, but it, it was time for it to go. And so got a new car and there's one of the things that you need to kind of maintain that, that, uh, freelancing, the, the, the part of that part of your freelancing, uh, style, lifestyle is you got to have reliable transportation. Um, yeah. So what, what kind of marimba will a RAV4 accommodate? <laughs> Oh man, that's a good question. No, I can. It's actually, it's got some, it's got some space in there. You know, I, uh, any kind of marimba. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty curious. How do those Malatek marimbas break down with those resonators? How is that? I you have just no take idea. your marimba with you. You just take your marimba to the the car lot with you. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 mean, actually, I okay. So I have a Rav4 also, and I did nice. take measurements. And that, oh yeah, a, <laughs> yeah. I have a marimba one, but the cases. You know, I, I measured the cases, and that had uh an effect on what i was looking at and not looking at <laughs> Did, so, so you were just... able to you can fit a marimba one uh in there yep. can't you yep. yeah yeah definitely i mean yep. i've transferred in the cases uh... yeah wow as part of it is not only the space on the inside but the 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 width of the mouth of the back right? yeah 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 yeah, Big. yeah kind of I like have how, the, how the... the sorry keep on keep going I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, I was just going to, I have a matrix, which is a little smaller than a RAV4 and the, like the volume inside could accommodate the marimba, but none, like the hatch is four inches too narrow Yep. to get anything in. And it's just, like, yeah, crap. yeah. Oh, no, I'm so happy with because I can even put a vibraphone in without breaking it down. Um, wow. nice. Not like not the older, really. the, not would the mustard pro 55s, but we have two of the, um, newer Adams vibraphones, one of the alphas, and I can, if I lower it all the way, I can put it in without breaking it down. Really? That's yeah. awesome. Oh, wow. Wow. Well, that's freaking You know, rad. um, yeah, I, when I was, it's freaking when I was... rav, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It seems like the big cars, I've, everyone has a Honda Fit or a rav. I did yeah, drive a really Honda good. Fit at the same time, too, and it was just felt See? so mm. low to the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I had like been in a bus accident, not that far before I was buying this car. And so I was just like, this does not feel safe to me. <laughs> I had seen, um, okay. Do you guys remember those cars the really tiny cars? I forget who made them, but they were called geos. Maybe it was like a GMC geo or I remember that know, I do. Chevy geo or something. Um, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I remember Tom Burritt and one of his, um, um, older DMA students from a long time ago, um, came and did a master class while I was at Del Mar college. And they, he was with Mallet Tech at the time and brought down one of those Mallet Tech marimbas in that Geo. I wow. Think. This little tiny car in like was holding this, this, this uh, marimba. I was amazed. I was like, man, I, I pretty, yeah, it was just, I, if it was a Geo or it was a, like really small car. I mean, I, I know you guys had them on recently. You might want to like uh, follow up with that. But yeah, I was like, I hear people driving Honda Fits all the time, fitting in five octave instruments. It's just like, whoa. But uh, huh. yeah, trunk wow. trunk space is pretty big deal. It's a game. It's a it's a deal it's breaker. Important. It is. Yeah, yeah. So, what should you spend your money on first? Uh, you know, a ten thousand dollar marimba or buying a car? Oh, which should come first? You know, Jacob, I didn't have a I didn't have my own car until I met you in Houston. So I was. Is that right? Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I was on my second master's degree at that time. So it was very late in my life. Definitely. Well, if you're going to be in Houston, you know, moving to Texas, you ne you definitely need a car to get around. Right. <laughs> um, but that's a good question. Um, car I mean, or marimba? <laughs> hmm. I guess it depends on your life for sure, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on what your situation is. I mean, for me right now, I would probably I, my money had to go to the car because I have. 
you know, the places where I teach, there are instruments there that I can practice on. I mean, it may not be at home, but, you know, I can still still have access to an instrument that if, if I needed. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a tough call. <laughs> yeah, I think I go with the I go with the car, I suppose. Um, I think I, it depends on what you're doing, too, you know? Yeah, that too, yeah. I mean, I'm not exactly a, a soloist, so, you know, I don't really... I haven't been shedding much marimba rep lately, so maybe maybe somebody else who is always you know kind of getting the you know I don't know yeah <laughs> it really really yeah. does depend yeah what you got Laurel yeah I was just gonna ask Jacob it sounds like you are super busy so you're done with coursework yeah like yeah I am I took my last I'm in my second. A year out of school, so I took my last class in spring 2015. Okay. So I'm, yeah, I, I kind of, yeah, everybody seems to kind of say that. I mean, that's uh, that seems to be everyone's mo around here. If you're not a band director, or you know, if you don't have the the full time higher ed position, you're, you know, you've got a mix, a good mix of things going on you know you're teaching private lessons or you're you're also gigging um lots of lots of work around here was really really fortunate you know to be in this area but um you know and i guess the you know the it it makes it it also is kind of hard though to finish i'll I'll mention that um i mean i'm in i'm trying to I'm, i'm projected to graduate hopefully in december um so I've definitely taken my time out, out, out um, as soon as I left UNT. So, uh, you know, we got, you're trying to balance. It's, it's been, it's definitely been a challenge to balance, you know, your work with, you know, with you really trying to finish up school and, you know, things, things like that and job hunting and taking auditions and all those, all those other things. I'm sure, you know, uh, many people uh, can relate to that. Yeah. That Buying a house. Didn't you just buy a house? Yeah, we did. Um, we just did. Yeah, we got to kind of have a lot going on. Um, we we are we're currently renting a home that's kind of in it's in the located in the colony. It's a north. It's kind of um, it's on the north side of DFW. It's it's kind of it's nowhere near Denton. So. Um, well, I mean, it's, I guess it's kind of close. Anyway, so we were renting a home, but we were, you know, our rent payments were pretty high. And so, you know, we don't, I don't, I don't know where I'm going to be in the foreseeable future. You know, I can only plan ahead. And if, if any job openings come up, we just figured, uh, if we're going to be kind of staying here. We're going to be paying this amount, amount of rent and the housing market is been pretty good and so we figured it'd be a good investment to kind of just, you know, instead of paying all that money in rent, why not go for go through it with a mortgage. Luckily we got approved and we found a home and yeah, we're not moving too far, just a little bit further North. So it makes my commutes, um, eh, kind of the same. So for, for Alyssa, she, she probably has a little bit further commute to her job. So, but yeah, we made the, made the jump and bought a home. It was, um, well, congrats for sure. It's Mm -hmm. really exciting. It was way easier than, I expected, right, Laurel? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. At least that was our experience. You're like, we're willing to buy a building. And they're like, oh, (laughs) we can help you do that. (laughs) Nice, nice. Yeah, it was definitely a roller coaster ride for us because, you know, there's, I mean, that there's a ton of houses going up, but what a lot of people are doing in this area, there's a lot of, like, um, uh, I guess companies that are there, you know, home buyers that buy the house and rent it almost immediately, like at a certain price point. So like, you know, our price point that we were looking for, there weren't that many homes because as soon as they would be built, they would be purchased and would be rented. You know, people who would like to rent versus to buy. So mm. a lot of the homes that were available were like out of our price range. So it was like, it was kind of a, it's like a good game of, Catch and mouse. Uh, I mean, cat and mouse. And so we were. It was. Uh, it was exciting. It was definitely a roller coaster ride. Um, it was stressful a little bit <laughs> for us, but um, yeah, we figured we should get one now before the housing market and all the interest rates really tend to 
really go up. They call that the right. Trump effect. So, you know. Oh, boy. We don't talk yeah. about that on this podcast ever. Yeah. <laughs> and it begins. <laughs> Oh, we never we never bring up anything like that on the podcast. Well, it's really cool. It's just it's nice to hear you're working all these places while finishing your degree and you know, Megan just finished her last bits of her degree. It's really well, kind of. Oh, wait. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. No, on on Saturday, a week from today, I'm giving my lecture recital. No oh, way. great. Yeah, well, and then the next day I'm doing orals, and then I'm done. So I don't want to jinx it, but I could be a doctor in one week. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, well, congrats for making it that far. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I'm with you, though. It's, like, so hard to to balance jobs, and and I, I just – I've said this before on the podcast, but I just never thought I would be one of those people that, like, it was in danger of not finishing. <laughs> I was like, mm. how do people do that, you know? And I totally see how people don't finish now. It's really yeah. hard to have time. And for me, I needed someone to be like, you have to finish this or it will, um, you know, it, it, it could affect your job. I needed someone to say that to me. And so <laughs> because wow. that's what it required to make the time for it, because there are so many things that um, are required by your job. And, you know, it's more it, being a percussion professor is more than a full time job, especially if you're also continuing a playing career. And there's just no room. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I. Yeah, I've noticed every time, you know, if you guys have any advice, I'd love to hear it. I've noticed every time I have a, you know, you guys look, you can see my office right now. I mean, it's functional, but it's it's messy. <laughs> it's like there's, I have all these little plans to get ahead and, you know, do something today to make tomorrow easier. But every time you think you have time to do that, I mean, there's always something that immediately needs to I know, be done. Casey. Right I now. know. So like every time you go, okay, today was crazy. I'm going to do some stuff tomorrow to make the next day easier. You just never find that window. And yeah. It's, um, yeah. I don't know. It feels like school when you were always scrambling to get the thing you immediately had due that night or that day or whatever, and you can never get ahead. And now it's hard because yeah. it's like, wait, this is real life. This isn't like I'm going to be doing this for two or three years in grad school or four years of yeah. undergrad. It's like, this is my life. I have to figure this out, you know, because <laughs> yeah, you true. keep doing that the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Right. And, they, you know, you, your teachers would always tell you, you know, you, you have more, more, I guess, uh, while you're a student, you know, you want to practice and get all these things done because, you know, you have the time now. But then when you get out and you're working, there is actually there is zero time, you know, and it's kind of like you don't really realize that until you're out there and you're trying to make things happen. And you're, mm -hmm. you're just kind of, you know, when if it's one thing or another, you know, I guess it's, you know, it's a it's a common I guess it's a good problem. You know, it's not a bad problem. You know, I, I would like to say, you know, you want to stay busy and I do self motivated and all those. Yeah. And, and of course, I've heard that. And I do I do feel that. I have to say, I was talking to one of my students who was expressing the same kind of thing. You know, once I get the job, I'm going to have even less time. That's so scary. And he said to me that he, well, he assumed, okay, I must have gotten out most of my compositions and recordings before I had that teaching gig. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, actually, after the teaching gig, and we went and looked up just my, my YouTube page and just looked at the years that followed. And I think a lot of our busyness, like we don't have to do this podcast. Right. You know, we could definitely choose to, like I didn't have to go to the Petrushka concert tonight. I mean, it's not like I was mandated to. And I think a lot of it is, you know, if you survive school and you survive these programs, you three have just gotten through, uh, Jacob, Megan, and, and Brandon, you're going to have this like, th that grit they talk about in the 10,000 hour rule. You know, you're going to have that, you know, not doing anything half at all. Everything is full throttle, you know. And oh, yeah, absolutely. Point. Perhaps yeah. that's just something it does to you, you know. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's good because, hey, here we are all, you know, doing well at our, our, our given, um, you know, stations in, in the field right now, you know. Mm -hmm. So maybe that just goes along with it. Yeah. True. Deep thoughts with that percussion. Deep thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Megan, speaking of school, is that an awesome segue into your Yeah, topic that's an awesome what? segue. That's awesome. Good job. So I somebody had, uh, I believe his name was Tom McGuire. Let me look it up here. It's Tom McGuire, Tom McGuire, Tom McGuire. Just messaging with him. Tom McGuire had asked me um, what episode 
I had talked about student loan debt forgiveness on, and it was episode seven with Ted, Ted Atkatz. And it reminded me of an article I read um, a few weeks ago that really made me freak out. So I thought I would bring this topic up again, especially with our guest today and um, those of us who have been through a lot of school and might have student loan debt. Um, and so I just wanted to, to bring up a couple of things I had said before, which is awareness about the student, uh, the public service loan forgiveness plan. Um, and that is a plan where if you're working at a nonprofit organization for 10 years full time, uh, after 10 years of qualifying payments, you're, you can apply to have the rest of your loans forgiven. <laughs> and this plan does exist uh, for 20 years, too, if you're not working in public service, but if you're paying your loans for 20 years on one of the qualifying repayment plans that you're, you can apply to have your loans forgiven. Um, so for me, that I, I saw that the 10-year plan, I said, oh, my gosh, this is this – is, this makes a lot of sense because rather than paying as much money as you possibly can every single month to try to get your loans down, now I can focus on saving money to buy a house or traveling or doing things rather than just putting all my paychecks into student loan forgiveness so or into student loan payments. So just for a, few, a little bit more information about the, the public service loan forgiveness plan, um, you have to submit a employment recertification form every single year. And what that is, is your employer fills it out, you fill it out, it tells how much money you're making so they can re, um, reassess how much you should be paying if you're on the income-based repayment plan. And it also qualifies that you're working, that you are, it, it signifies that you are working at an institution or with an organization that qualifies for the public service loan forgiveness plan. Now, the thing that's scary, this is the update, is that this is the, the public service loan forgiveness plan. It's not like a program that you apply for, you are accepted into, and you are guaranteed to have your loans forgiven after 10 years or the other one after 20 years. It's you are on the track to apply to have your loans forgiven. So the scary article is um, something a good friend of mine who lives in Shanghai, she's not a, uh, a musician for a career. She works for Apple. She had posted this on her Facebook page, and it's from the New York Times, March 30th. It's a, The title is, Student Loan Forgiveness Program Approval Letters May Be Invalid, Education Department Says. I saw that. I said, oh, my gosh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? So I read the article, and I think I overreacted. The title is a little bit um, misleading. This only happened to a couple of people, and several people fought it in um, one, but this program started in 2007. So right now, 2017, this is when people are going to start submitting for, uh, for forgiveness for their loans. So it's the first, it's the first time this program has existed for 10 years, but now is the time when, when, when loans are going to start being forgiven. So under the current administration, I think that there's, there is some restructuring with how student loans are, are given and forgiven, and that could change in the future. And that is what's scary is that this plan could change. But what happened with, with these several people is that their employers or their employment recertification plans that, that they were submitting where um, someone was approving them and they weren't supposed to be approved. Whoa. So it was for, let me see if I can find the, um, it was bad news for a few people. And like I said, some people fought it and others um, and, and some of them were able to get it. So I think we're mostly safe as musicians because it's very clear that what we do um, if we're working for a nonprofit organization or with a public university, I think that that's, that's very clear. There's not really any gray area there. Um, hmm. so anyway, good news and bad news, I guess, but I just thought it would be a good time to bring up this, this, uh, this topic again. And just to summarize what I had said last time in episode seven, you can go back and listen to that segment, but it takes a lot of time to get onto this plan and to make sure that your loans are, um, what's the word? what's the word consolidated right uh -huh. and you cannot reconsolidate it screws up the whole thing so you have to consolidate one time and start these 
repayments. But it takes, it took me a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of hours on the phone, a lot of research, a lot of asking different people. And there's only one uh, servicer that, that does this public loan service loan forgiveness plan is the Fed Loan Servicing. So if you are coming out of school right now and you're about to start making payments on your student loans, I would suggest getting in touch with Fed Loan Servicing and trying to consolidate your loans and getting onto this plan if you have a lot of student loan debts. Um, and even if you don't have a lot, if you calculate the calculate what you would be paying over 10 years based on your projected income, it could save you money, you know? Wow. Uh, but you have to be careful with it. And this is what makes me nervous is all of this interest is accruing while I'm, you know, making these small payments based on, on my income as a musician. Um, so it's a little bit nerve wracking that like, mm. if this weren't to work out for some reason that I'm going to be screwed in 10 years, right? Does it have to be full payments or are you allowed to be on the income based repayment? You are allowed to be on the income based repayment plan. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I, cause the standard, I, I can't afford the standard repayment. I can't, yeah. I can't afford that. I have a full-time job. So how does that, how does that work? If you start, like, say you get a gig at one university, you're there for four years full time, you get a different gig in another place that carries over, right? That's fine. Uh, that does carry over and, and you can kind of keep track. You, you right. figure it out, you know, once you submit this recertification application, uh, form every year, you're supposed to do it every year. And that's, what's important to do. Cause some of these people I think didn't do that throughout the 10 years. And then they're like, wait, this doesn't count you know, why, why not? So if you're doing it every single year and you can see, okay, I've made, you have to make 120 qualifying payments, 10 years. Um, I can see, you know, I'm at 30 or whatever, and then I'll submit mm -hmm. it next year and uh, 42, or whatever. And on time is a big part of that. Yep. You have to make on time. On time. Payments. Absolutely. So you really, 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 really have to stay on top of it. And that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I still haven't met anyone who's on this plan. Um, and I mean, this isn't a topic that I talk to everyone I know about. <laughs> it seems but like everyone would be on it. I mean, it seems anyone like who's listening, like if you are on it, maybe reach out to me and let me know. I'm just, I'm curious because I've even had friends who are like, oh, that's a really good idea. Like I really need to look into that. And then they haven't done it or they looked into it and they're like, oh yeah, it's too complicated or whatever. And I just, you know, student loans are a scary thing. And I think they are not scary, at least for me, they weren't scary when I was in school because I didn't see them, the amount every day. And now that I see it, it's it's real life and it's scary. So Megan, I think, I, I think you've got insight that a lot of people don't. Like, it seems like you're able, and I think everyone needs to have this, you know, you feel how bad this is without like before you're starving, you know, like, like a lot of yeah. people, I think they just, until it is actually affecting their daily lives, like until they yeah. actually swipe their debit card and they can't buy groceries, they're not going to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. so and and also, it's like so I said, important you're saying this, you know? Yeah. And also, like I said, it's like, okay, I could also just slave for the next 10 years and put every penny that I make into this. And I don't want to do that. I want to live right. my life. I want to travel. Yeah. I want to have the security that I can make a payment like a car payment for 10 years. And I can plan on that rather than dumping every single penny into this. Um, cause that was that, you know, that was the plan all along. That's why I decided to be a musician. I don't, I, if, <laughs> I would have made decisions differently. I think, I think about my career, you know, right. if that was, if say, that was the case. I would say, I think it's a little misleading or uh, difficult to navigate because I know some people have told me before people that have been out in the world a little bit, full-time gigs and, and, uh, the impression I got from them, because I haven't looked at this yet myself, to be honest. Um, I mean, I know about it, but, uh, they were saying that it's not really a plan. I'm not arguing against what you're saying. I'm saying what sure, sure, somebody sure. else has said to me. Uh, they were saying that, oh, well, you know, yeah, you go, you get your full-time gig, 120 on-time payments, and then you apply. Exactly. That there was nothing to do up until that point, right? Oh, no. They were making oh, it God, sound, no. Right. And that oh, was God, the confusing no. part because some people were saying, no, there's nothing to do up front. You just wait until your 10 years are done, and then you act. But you're suggesting, no, you me. have to do that now. That's what terrifies me that people think that because that's huh. not true. Absolutely. Right. You have to, you have to be, you have to have, you have to be making payments through Fed Loan Servicing, which is the only loan servicer that does like each loan servicer, Nelnet, Fed Loan Servicing. I don't know if you can name others specialize in different things. So I think Nelnet, which is what I had first, 
I think that's mm-hmm. like automatically what Eastman puts you on, or maybe Florida State or something. I don't know. And they service in dis they specialize in disability forgiveness. So Fed Loan Servicing specializes in public service loan forgiveness and maybe other things too, but they're the only ones to do that. So you have to move your loans to them. You have to consolidate your loans. They have to to be um, federal loans also. Private loans don't count at all. Um, Some uh, subsidized and unsubsidized count, right? Yes, both. Just subsidized and unsubsidized, exactly. So I, I could give just a little more information since um, you weren't with us on that earlier episode, but um, basically what you have to do, I've got four easy, easy steps here. I'll just recap real quick. <laughs> Number one, find a loan servicer and consolidate your loans. That's Fed Loan Servicing. Um, they support the U.S. Department of Education's ability to service student loans, and they are owned by the federal government. You have to talk to a specialist about public service loan forgiveness. You have to make sure that you, if so, if you are already making payments, they don't count. You have to be on the plan. You have to be making qualifying payments. Two, you sign up for the income-based repayment plan, or you can stay on the standard repayment plan. But if if you're if all signs are pointing to this plan would be good for you, you're probably not going to be making the standard payment. Does that make sense to you? So um, yeah. you're probably going to be on the income-based repayment plan, which is just a percentage of your income. Three, you have to make 120 qualifying payments every year. You have to submit an employee form to prove you have worked at said institution for the full year. And then your qualifying payments will be added uh, to your account so you can track it and see how far along you are. Um, there's an employment employment employee certification form on the website that you have to fill out and your employer has to fill out as well. It takes one to two months to process it every year. And then four, at the end of your 10 years or in your 120 qualifying payments, then you submit the PSLF application um, to receive loan forgiveness. Um, it says when I gave this little presentation before the application was under development, um, and would be available for prior to October, 2017, which is the date when the first borrower borrowers will become eligible. So I'm just hoping that there's a little bit of confusion when those first borrowers submitted, um, and that this will all get worked out, but hopefully the current administration does not change anything and will still allow people to attend the schools that they know, um, will be the best fit for them for their education um, yeah. because it's it's it is wonderful that we're allowed to borrow money you know at, at, at lower interest rates because I know people from other countries can't always do that you know we're very lucky to be able to do that we just have to be smart about it one thing I did hear that was changed and this is just related and I believe they called it um, let's see Trump waved a memo that Obama had written about debt collectors so you know, insurance companies will hire debt collectors to collect your debt from you and the interest on the debt you owe. And the memo had stated that the debt collectors could not charge you this extra fee. Oh, right. I heard about that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that a servicer? Now that's gone. So isn't that what a servicer is though? Essentially? I'm I'm not sure. I don't know that. What's a Because I mean, a servicer like basically bought your loan bought you from the feds, you know what I mean? And then they no, took over the program, th- no, which is why they service like it. A, no, I think this is like a traditional debt collector, as in the insurance okay. company hires this agency, and they would pay them a fee, but I guess the debt collector yeah. can also charge you a fee. And there was mm-hmm. a, mem- a memo. They called it a memo. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but um, which I guess is yeah. just like an order, but that they can't charge you that additional fee and I, I guess now they can yeah so, i find myself very bothered that the the policy makers and those that argue about student loans are people who are frankly of an age that they didn't experience any of this right yeah. they just didn't I and mean, i know that a lot of mba programs for example have been quite expensive for a long time but that's also a completely different field. Like med school has been pricey. That's also a field that uh, you can feasibly pay that back in in a certain amount of time. Um, Yeah, but But, I find myself very bothered because they just have no idea. (laughs) Well, unfortunately, they would just tell you you should have done something else. You know, they don't seem very empathetic. 
But the thing also about about changing this this potentially changing this plan and this talks about this in the article is that people made huge life decisions based on the availability of this plan. For example, even people who were who, who took out loans to be a lawyer instead of signing on. And this is the point of the plan. Instead of signing on to some huge private or small private company um, where they're going to make more money and they can pay back all their loans, they decided to work for the state or, you know, or, or work for a nonprofit where they're going to make less money. But, but in doing the calculations, um, if their loans were forgiven after 10 years, it would be worth it. And they would, they felt good about taking that kind of job. So that's the whole point of this program. It's an incentive program for people to work in public service, yeah. you know? Yeah. So hello, point. why would they change it? Right. And also one, one other fact is that more than 550,000 people have signed up for this plan. That's actually not that many people. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of people. Do you think in 10 years, all the people going to college? Well, that's what it's I was saying before. You said, I don't know anyone in this plan. And I said, yeah, I would think you would know a lot. I know. You know, but but no, I, I, you're Megan. You're the only person I've ever heard talk about it. You so, know? what are the other kind of uh, jobs that apply for this? You know, with us as musicians. I mean, traditionally, I, I always thought of it as being like a full time teacher, whether it's in K through twelve or a college, or if it was, I don't know. I guess. Maybe a full musician, uh, orchestral musician might count, but what yeah, else might be on that list? Be, it has to be a nonprofit. So if you're teaching at a private university, that probably wouldn't count. Um, so the only reason my job counts is because it's a state institution, so it's a nonprofit. Um, working for a, an orchestra, playing or in the administrative. Most orchestras are nonprofit organizations. Um, working for like a community arts organization makes sense um huh. and do, also uh, i'm pretty sure that you can if you have a number of hours that add up to full-time work like let's say you're part-time working admin in, with an orchestra or something and then you're part-time i don't know teaching or something but as long as your employer is saying this person is working 20 hours a week and this is a nonprofit organization and it qualifies and this is 20 and it qualifies and that's consistent um then i as far as i the questions that i've asked as far as i know it sounds like that that works too I think so you can actually piece it together. Easier, but I, I'm pretty sure you can piece it together. But again, I don't know anyone in this plan. So I'm hesitant to say that until I know someone who is actually doing yeah. that. But from the research that I have done, it appears that you can do that. Well, thanks for bringing this up. I think this is all good. That's so very important. Yeah. 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 Just looking out for everybody, you know. Right. Well, and I wonder, I wonder think you helped that. Yeah. I wonder oh, if I'm that's sorry, why a lot of people haven't why we haven't heard of anybody pursuing it yet is because you know they they haven't seen it work for other people yet so they're very hesitant to you know feel like it's a concrete safe thing to go and do but like okay first of all who's thinking about this decision when they're 18 number right. one no, and number right, yeah. two it's going to be too late if you decide to do it later and yeah. three it doesn't cost it costs you less money unless you are paying more towards your loans. But yeah. if you're making the minimum payment every month anyway, which I would assume a lot of people are doing, then yeah, what's to lose? Not, just, it doesn't cost any money. I just really like how everyone here at the table like is approaching it, you know, Megan, and I think about the, the student that the master student that you and I talked about who auditioned at both our schools. And man, it was so easy for me to tell her man, I'd love for you to come here, but if Megan has a scholarship for you, go there. You know, I, I just, I, yeah. I don't, I don't know how many times that was said, you know, 20 years ago. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe it yeah. was, but I, I just, that feels like the ethical, honest thing to do because right. th this is so much money, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. Oh, well, Thanks, I by the way. I'll definitely have her on the podcast so you can... Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's the that, yeah. We we worked that out. Yeah, yeah. She so knows she yeah. <laughs> I remember being in undergrad and hearing some of the professors. You know, the older professors say like, "No, it's all worth it." Like, yeah, you'll have to take out loans and da da da. And yeah, being on this side, it's like, dude, your loan was probably what four thousand dollars. People <laughs> right. now, the loans are like over a hundred. This is not 
it's not even close to the same. Yeah. It's like you're not even in a place to give advice about this. Yeah. yeah. And it really right. adds up so fast. I had no debt after my first two degrees. All my debt is from one degree and it just, it adds up real fast. Yeah. You know, mm. I think part of what makes it hard is like, especially if you're at a conservatory or somewhere, everybody around you is doing it. So it just feels like a normal part of the process. Yeah. I remember, I don't, Jacob, you have to tell me if you remember this. I feel, I feel like everybody was walking back from 1260 one night in Boston during school when we were doing our masters together. And I f forget who said it first, but I was like, Hey, Jacob, how you doing? You, you, you said, I'm good. I didn't spend any money today. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, I, re I remember that. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was always a big day because, you know, for, for those kinds of schools, I mean, the students would all, would most traditionally, at least I did, you know, you're borrowing money for to pay tuition and you're also borrowing money for cost of living, you know, because most of us really weren't. I mean, I had a part time job, but it was no way it was, you know, it wasn't enough. So so there would always be a, a day every every semester where it would be like federal refund day. And, and everyone's just trying their their, their everyone's, um, you know, pinching their pennies. You know, and it's really hard to do that in in a place like Boston. You know, and yeah, you know, but uh, I think, yeah, that's, I think there's one thing like uh, Casey. You know, earlier in the week when we spoke, you had a student that brought up like not feeling like they uh, were maybe qualified enough to go out and do something to make some money uh, as a musician yet. Like they didn't feel like a right. pro, like they should be able to go out. Uh, Jacob, do you have any advice? I mean, you're a freelance guy, as am I. Uh, do you have advice for maybe some of the students still in school for how they can use some of the skills that they have now and act on that so that maybe they could take, you know, less student loans out or, you know, start to get their name out there? Uh, um, okay, so so it's, I don't know, like, that's kind of a hard question to, or it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem to I don't know if it's a problem. So it's a hard situation to address. Um, I mean, if you're going to kind of go, go out and you're trying to collect work doing music or music related or the teaching, or you could try to find some kind of uh, supplemental, some something that's consistent. I don't know if you're in an area where, like, I'm, at least for me, I'm always trying to get my students out to teach like private lessons you know so they can kind of get them in the area and they're kind of earning money towards you know to to towards whatever their you know their needs living cost of living tuition things like that um yeah, maybe it also kind of boils down to like who you who you know who your connections are you, you know kind of uh, I don't know if I'm even answering this question correctly that's I mean it, that's all right I mean that's like a that's a it's one of those things where you kind of just fall into and, you know, you make the most of every, all of your opportunities. You know, I just, you know, some teachers would always say that every performance that you do is an audition for somebody's watching or somebody's, you know, or any, anything that you say or do, somebody may would like to take you up on that. You know, you can uh, you get work out of that. Um, I don't know if you're trying to, uh, I'm just trying to think about like how I kind of I, my from my personal experiences how I kind of fell into all the work that I did. I mean, I just took a whole bunch of auditions and you know I just put myself out there. I used all the you know all, all the things that I learned from my friends and teachers and schools. Um, you can also do a lot of you know personal creative work, which I'm sure all of you have done. First, in Casey, you know I would always see Casey like. It, a lot of his early YouTube videos, you know, <laughs> back when you know the. Uh, you know, people would see those things and they would reach out to you and maybe you would get uh, you can get ahead on some kind of uh, solo work or maybe like uh, any kind of new music uh, opportunities. It's all about music or... boxes on timpani now. That's like all anyone's doing. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, oh, that's, nice. like... that's so freaking creepy. It's cool though. Oh man, it's like all anybody's into these days. <laughs> Well, thanks, Jacob. That's really cool. I, I loved what you said earlier, what you and Laurel said about being in Boston 
And he said, I did well. I didn't spend any money today. And it actually made me think about, <laughs> you, you know, on, on one hand, the, you know, if, if I could just be devil's advocate here and say, like, I think the conservative viewpoint on these loans and, you know, school being a free ride, like, is a valuable viewpoint. Because, Laurel, you remember there was <laughs> a particular student. It was, uh, hey, your, uh, your check change came in the other day. And, oh, but it it supposedly wasn't enough to buy the book he needed for music history class, but then his roommate's like, hey, dude, I think your Xbox that you just bought came in the mail. Oh, gosh. And, cool. Mm-hmm. And see, I don't have a problem with that because I think every student does need an Xbox, but, you know, <laughs> that's, uh, I mean, that's, uh, you, you do see a lot of that. And I do remember being in Boston because everyone listening, I went to Boston Conservatory too, just not when Laurel and Jacob did. I was a few years older. But, um, I do remember that, like the students who did have loans, they were really comfortable. I had no loans, so that's really lucky because it means, okay, you don't have a loan to pay back, but you are, I mean, I was dirt poor for, you know, I mean, uh, a decade. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, yeah, totally. No, yeah, Um, we definitely were... (laughs) So on yeah, one hand, yeah. people look at like someone with no loan or a student with no loan, and they go like, "Oh man, you're you got it made. You're so lucky." It's like, well, yeah, I can't uh, afford anything Too much. right now. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think yeah. Yeah, of course we got to encourage people to to look for these these ways of taking care of themselves by getting jobs in the future, being prepared for jobs, and nailing their auditions, nailing their job interviews, and then also looking at the smartest ways to pay back their loans and being mm-hmm. just responsible. But also in the meantime, like, okay, every, every day up to that, man, you just got to be like way smart and responsible with your, with your money. You know? Yeah. I, and I, I think, once, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was, Oh, sorry, Jacob. No, I was just okay. going to say one thing that, um, like if they offer to give you a loan of this amount, what's the actual least amount that you could take? Yeah. Um, yeah. just because th- thinking about people who, maybe some would say abused the loans they were given. You know, I have a cousin who's uh, finishing a fellowship in radiology and is going to make a lot of money. Um, And in med school, he lived in the nicest part of the city. He took a trip to South Africa for two weeks. He took a trip to Patagonia, you know, and it's like, I know that he was also like a waiter and working in a lab, but it's like, dude, those two jobs did not afford you those trips and that lifestyle that you were living. I am being smart about the loans that you do have because they all have different uh, APRs and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have a Stafford loan, it's all this fixed stuff, but you can play that game too. I once, yeah. uh, I once met a guy um, in Boston. Or I was when well, I was had this part-time job. He was a photography major at like either Emerson College or or something. And so you know, and he was taking out loans. He bought a car with one of his uh, right. with his student refund. Like he was he was. I heard that, and I heard, and he told he was telling everybody about it. Cool. Made me sick, man. I was like, Golly, how can how in the world are you? I'm over here crossing my butt trying to just make some money. I don't right. even have to be, I, I could have taken out more money in loans, but, uh, you know, it's no way I can do that. And you're over here well, just I, blowing well, your I, money on cars. I think Sorry. seeing enough oh. of that, you know, seeing enough of that will really harden you, you know, and you'll, you'll want yeah. to say, like, no, these people don't deserve any forgiveness. Just like if you're in a really, you know, depressed area and you see – how people will abuse, say, their welfare, which is another, oh, you know, yeah. another, another liberal Repu- Republican, like, you know, really emotional, uh, similar type of argument. Right. And yeah, man. When you see people like, you, you know, um, God, the, the things we heard about where we lived, Laurel. I mean, yeah, it's stealing their, stealing their, uh, grandparents their grandma's medication, to... and selling it, and I mean, just oh, like. My. Oh, yeah, it'll just make you think like, okay, yeah, welfare. Nope, nobody gets welfare. It's bad. Yeah, I'm sure there's a few that need it, but the majority of what's around me, this is what I'm seeing, you know? Yeah. It's just, yeah, yeah it's a, I don't know. It's, it's really hard, and we probably do need both points of view to have some kind of balance, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. Well, well that, was de- that was miserable. 
Yeah. <laughs> you guys want to hear about Chamber Music America now? Yes, yeah, 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 sure. yeah. I'd love okay. to. Yeah, way to go, Megan. No, that was that was actually that was really good. Thank you. Wait, Hard Megan. So what's what's what is your what is your topic gonna be? I don't know. Wait, For my lecture you... recital? Yes. Yes. Ah. Yeah. Well, I my title is. Um, sorry, I just changed it, but <laughs> I am uh, presenting on Per Norgard's I Ching. I'm talking about uh, Bolognese influence and the Infinity series. Oh wow. So wow. I just changed it to time or times, Bolognese influence and the infinity series in Pierre Norgard's I Ching. And I'm playing the, the third and fourth movements. Which one has wow. the beer on the timpani? Which movement that's is that? That's three. I'm doing that one, yeah. Oh, that's like one of my yeah. favorite pieces yeah. of music in Me existence. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm right now, I, I'm a week out on my top... I. It, it's, it's a little getting too big. I got to figure out how to like condense it a little bit more. Yeah. So one option is cutting that movement. And I don't want to, um, but I'm just trying to decide if I can exemplify everything I'm talking about just in the fourth movement to make a little bit less music. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting is... though. I mean, they, he was traveling to Per Norgard was he, he's a Danish composer. He traveled to Bali. Like a lot of things that were a lot of things that were present in his music before could be deemed as Balinese influence, even before he heard a Balinese gamelan. Wow. And once he started learning about it, he said, I have to go there. I have to see this. And so he wrote I Ching in 82 and he started traveling to Bali in 75. So there's just so many obvious influences, even from the instruments he employs in that fourth movement there, you know, it specifically asked for Ching Chang and Unklung and a Balinese gong. Um, but also like hierarchical rhythmic structure, a cello rondos and rollantandos, um, muting the drums, um, kind of interlocking rhythms. There's just like, it's packed with it. So, so how do we, okay. So you given this awesome lecture, Jacob will Brandon did, or Jacob did already. I don't know. But like, no, I'm going to. Like, oh. is, there, is there an archive? Like, just like you can go find dissertations, can you go f listen to the presentation somewhere? I don't think so. Um, That's the I, I, Not I, I, at UNT, I, I think they do so at UNT. I think they archive them, but I think you have to be a student or you have to have some kind of subscription or right. something. Specifically lecture recitals? Right, so they ar ar archive them just like they do performances and they're in the library. Yeah, I, th I think oh, so. I, th I, I think they do that at Eastman too because they are taped, yeah. But, like, I feel like this stuff happens all the time, and it would be so cool to – I mean, I would totally watch that, you know? I mean, at least the dissertations are published. Um, right. So you it sounds that. like a good thing for PAS to maybe get on. Yeah. To try to hunt those down from each institution. That's a good idea. So yeah. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that piece. Does the title teaching have anything to do with the actual – or the, you know, the, the – Yeah, the very same. Yeah, the Book of Changes, the Chinese Book yeah. of Changes. Yeah, it does. Um, and it all kind of ties, at least in the fourth movement, which I'm looking at the most closely right now, um, he uses this, this formula called the Infinity Series that he developed. And it's kind of based on the yin and yang that's found in the, in the Book of Changes. So, wow. But there are 64 different hexagrams in, in the I Ching. And he each movement is based on one of those. So he basically is choosing four. So it's a it's not quite uh, it, he's not using it in the way that John Cage used it, for example. Right. Uh, okay. So there's no, um, I guess, early, um, what's there is some improvisation, no, but not in, like chance. It's not chance music. Right. Okay. Well, that's cool. That sounds exciting. It sounds like yeah. you've had a nice or. Uh, uh, sounds like you may have had a, a ton of resources and uh, I don't know because like the, the big the big problem for everyone whenever they're trying to pick a topic is all right what what can you contribute and what hasn't been done already you know, <laughs> you yeah. know or, so yeah um, there's a percussionist who lives in New York now I, um, I'm probably saying his name wrong but Niraj Mehta I don't know if anyone knows him he's definitely done a lot of work on the music of of Per Norgard and did a Fulbright in Denmark. And wow. yeah, I would say he's probably the foremost scholar on, on Per Norgard. But um, as far as I know in the, re in the research that I've done, I don't think anyone's like specifically tried to pull Bal Eastern Balinese influence 
out out of the music. And it was just for me, it was like I had this topic idea a long time ago. And then when it actually came time to decide on a topic, I feel like I went through so many ideas and just felt like I couldn't find the right thing. And I came back to it. And I was like, yeah, I just I knew that all along. I should have hmm. trusted my gut. Mm-hmm. Um, and just because the first time I heard it and I, I studied uh, Balinese Gamelan at Eastman and at Florida State. So for me, it's kind of, I don't know, it kind of pulls all those things together and I can, you know, use my advisor's expertise in that, uh, in that way. And so it's been a good project for me. So the the people that are going to grade you on that are like your musicology professors, right? Yeah. It's a one musicology professor and then my applied teacher and then, um, my ethno teacher. Right. Yeah. Okay. So So, yeah, just imagine it's a mix of performance and academic. Like the, the, the stuff you're pulling out of it is going to be so new and it's going to be unique and it's not something I imagine the committee has training in. How, isn't that so hard to grade? No, I mean, I think the committee does have training in it and I think they? they're looking more at, well, I mean, for example, one of them is, um, has started the Gamelon. So she knows a lot I and mean, she studied in Bali. So she knows a lot about Bali's Gamelon. Um, obviously Michael Burt knows about percussion and I think it's more about the process and the research process yeah. rather than the actual facts. This is right. This is wrong with the process of, and that's the whole point of this exercise is putting together, um, an effective lecture. Yeah. I don't remember. Is this a DMA or a PhD over there? DMA. Eastman. Okay. That's right. I guess I asked that because I've, I, I've opened dissertations before and felt like I was reading a giant book report. And I think, okay, this is lame. And then I've opened other ones and I've thought, whoa, I have to look up all these words. This is all, this is informing me. This is all new. And it it makes me think that's, that's kind of what it should be. And I was, and I'm Mm -hmm. thinking like, wow, if I had to grade the student doing this, I'd have to go verify all of this information, you know, how is that, how is that possible for me? Of course, this, like the student is the new authority on this topic. And the student is, in fact, the the person you would have to cite, you know, on this thing because it is, in fact, really new material. And that I think is really, really cool. I mean, your your topic sounds like it's it's in that vein to me. Like I would not expect a, a, your average music history teacher to be able to say, "Oh, yeah, well, actually, you got this wrong." Uh, what you don't know about the I Ching is that uh, you know, they, would, would they know that already? You know, and of course, they're working with you on it, so. They're going to yeah. you know, know something, but yeah, that's, that's yeah, cool. it's a good, it's a good point. But I think, yeah, I think that's kind of the cool part about it too, is choosing your committee as much as you can based on people who are experts in your, in that area, but maybe with a different, in that general area, but with a different focus, you gotcha. know, so you can, yeah. Cool. Well guys, it's coming towards the end here, but man, Jacob, what is, What's right around the corner for you as far as things you're doing and gigs or something like that? Jacob still there? Oh, maybe not. Okay. Well, Uh-oh. Time, maybe we... Time out then. We lose um, him? Uh, here oh. He oh. I bet yeah. he'll... he'll uh... He'll be back. Come that. Well, Laurel, back. do you want to do is is Chamber Music America pretty short? We could still do yeah, it. Yeah, it's pretty short. You want to oh do yeah, that? sorry, I don't know how we got on the lecture title topic. No, that's great. No, that's... It's it's awesome. We should we should discuss. I like it when we discuss. You know, it's it's really good. I think when we discuss. Okay. I don't know if that made sense. What I was trying to say. I I've gotten so frustrated reading some dissertations because i feel like wait there's nothing new here you're just i know you're saying i'm so glad i didn't do dissertation for the exact re- that i mean yeah yeah like like you know what i mean it's uh it, i should feel like yeah. i'm reading something i don't already know you know i should feel like yeah. like i don't know anything about the I Ching. i know i think that piece is neat i feel like when i read that dissertation it should like you know so much of it should be i don't know i it's hard, yeah. to, hard to articulate what I'm trying to say. It should, feel, it should feel really new, you know? Yeah. By the way, new and, you know, also I like the practical ones too. Brandon, I was using yours to change Uh-oh. somebody heads. Oh, no. Nice. And they broke, right? No, actually it did, but not because of yours. 
but I like totally busted the 20 inch drum. Like, oh, that's busted, funny. busted. Oh, bummer. Not good. I'm, did it Dude, make to, any I sense? To, I might have to use yours soon too, because we're. I wrote it all in one night, so I hope it makes sense. It's about that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just did it one evening, right? Just like did it in a weekend. Isn't that how these yeah. things go? Yeah. Megan, did it actually make sense? Yeah, well, I used a variety of sources. I used your your dissertation, and I used the um, the user guide for the actual oh, timpani or the manual. Um, and then it was something else that was short that I didn't use as much. But I kind of used a combination because the manual was like too much information sometimes. So I I like haven't really done a lot of timpani maintenance at all. And so yours was especially good for just like listing step-by-step -step processes, you know, and like get an idea of like, okay, this is what I need to do. And then going into the manual for more specific information about the particular drop, you know? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it was helpful. I think, I don't know if you've done this already, but I've been making it, person. even like extracting just like, an, uh, extracting the maintenance part or the, the disc timpani changing head part and making it a PAS article would be super helpful. That's a good idea. Yeah, I've done certain forms of that, uh, but yeah, that's actually a summer project. But uh, I should add that to a list, maybe more in-depth uh, info, maybe on each step. Is that what you mean? Yeah, cool. Yeah. right, but just um, still compact, I felt like it was really helpful. Yeah. Hey, uh, Laurel, why don't you tell us a little bit about Chamber Music America and the grant you had to write? Yes. So as part of the grant application process for my duo with Chamber Music America, you have to join the society, which is something I, I didn't know. And I think it's $150 a year, something like that. And it gives you access to not only the grant, but to different resources and to their quarterly publication, which is called Chamber Music and I got my first issue in the mail just the other day, and so I decided to look through it, and I was pleasantly surprised with what I saw. Um, I think I sort of anticipated that, oh, Chamber Music America is just like all those other organizations that you're supposed to join when you're in school and that you hear about, and you get really overwhelmed with that. Um, but I was really, really pleased with what I found. And I thought, this is a great resource for me. And so um, I thought I would just give you a little bit of what is, what's in this particular issue about Chamber Music America. And one of those things, in light of the recent uh, somewhat threat to the NEA with the proposed budget changes, there's a bit about the history of Chamber Music America in here. So to start with that, in 1977, a group of musicians met with Adrian Nam the then director of the NEA's music program, and he said, I want you guys to form an umbrella organization through which the agency could provide a line of funding for chamber musicians. That was 40 years ago. And since then, uh, Chamber Music America has become this huge thing that has a grant program that sponsors different community programs, such as the Rural Residencies Program, which closed in 2001, Creativity Connects, Creative Forces, NEA Military Healing Arts Network, and CMA is also a member of the Performing Arts Alliance, which is a coalition of arts service organizations that meet to address issues that impact the members, which includes international exchange, net neutrality, and even things like airline regulations for instrument carry-ons. I feel like about every three weeks, there's a post on Facebook that goes through about some cellist who decided not to take a flight because they were going to make him check his cello <laughs> or something like that. But That's they, uh, a doctor that got physically dragged off oh, by the... I know. Uh. But one of the... Uh, uh, one of the early articles in this particular issue is called Call to Action, Voice Your Support for the NEA. So I feel like there's been so much happening in D.C. recently that we just heard about this threat to the NEA. And then it's kind of just been overshadowed by so many other things that have happened. But they list four steps that really are super clear that I know I'm going to do, and hopefully all our listeners can too. Number one, research the impact the NEA has had on your community um, so you can talk directly to your representatives about the ways that it has impacted not only you, but your local population. Number two, contact those representatives with the information that you find. 
If you're not sure who your representatives are, visit chamber-music.org slash extras, and they'll explain that to you. Number three is alert your audiences when you have them, when you're performing, so that they know uh, that this is happening. Because chances are, if they care about what you're doing enough to come to your performance, they care about the NEA and they want to know what's going on. Uh, they said, consider adding an alert in the printed program or making an announcement from the stage. Step four is to utilize social media. Post messages on your elected official social media pages. Use the hashtag Save the NEA and encourage your networks to engage their lawmakers through Twitter and Facebook posts, as well as any other social media outlets that you might use. So I was happy to see that because that wasn't just here's what our people are doing, but it was uh, a call to action. And I, I really appreciated seeing that. Well, I love, the last... the call, I love it when the call to action, I'm sorry to interrupt. I love it when the call to action is something I can do, you know? Right. And, and I mean, and like, I really, we really can do all those things very easily. You know, we're doing concerts. We're on the internet all the time. We, you know, you gave three ideas that you can do that are easier than calling your representatives in addition to calling representatives if you want, you know? Right. I like that those are all sort of ground up steps. You know, yes. it's not just go straight for the big people at the top, but it's no, we have to build a community of people that want to support art in all forms, not just music, but in all forms. Um, yeah. And that starts person to person. I think and it's just another part of our job as artists. Yeah. The other really cool thing in this particular issue is a little section called American Ensemble. And I must admit that I was a bit weary that it was just a whole lot of pictures of string quartets, which I find a little exhausting. Uh, but I was super stoked to turn the page and there's a little page about Neefnorf, Andy Bliss's uh, group nice. and summer festival. And there's even a short little interview with him. And I don't know if Neefnorf you know, applied to be part of this part of the issue or if they were sought out by the, the publishers, but it's just all about what Neefnorf is doing. And, um, you know, Andy says, uh, it all started like, wouldn't it be cool if I got these students together to give them the opportunity to play music, they can't play at their universities. And he says, I'm called a teacher cause I have this job and he's the percussion teacher at the university of Tennessee, but I'm no different from anybody else at the festival. I want to learn these pieces and keep my creative side on edge. And there's a nice picture of, uh, him and a pianist performing, I think at the square room in Knoxville. So I was, I was really happy to see that, that, um, even though it is a established chamber music organization, it also supports the newer instrumentations because something I've, uh, as I've looked further and further into grants, not just from Chamber Music America, but even New Music USA and other things, it seems like string quartets are always getting them. <laughs> and uh, yeah, not to be rude, but it's, it feels like there's already so much music for string quartet. And yes, it's beautiful. But come on, man, like there's so many other potential sounds that we could have. Do we need another new string quartet to celebrate the 20th anniversary of this string quartet? Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. I know. I feel, that's so rude to say. But but anyway, so I have high hopes for the application that my duo partner and I put in because, you know, anything involving percussion and especially uh you know, putting it with any other instrument is, is somewhat new and there aren't a lot of pieces that exist for that. So I have high hopes for how that's going to turn out. It's definitely the newest. Right. Mm -hmm. Wow. Way, way to go, Laurel. Thanks for the info. Sure. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, guys, like we lost steps. Jacob for a while there, but he is back. Jacob, are you, you done cooking? Over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I was just, I was just uh, washing my hands there. I had a little... Uh, I had a little, I had a little snack there, but I, I was last listening. But <laughs> I thought, he's either cooking or he's like unpacking from some multi-percussion solo that he just played. But... Oh yeah, I'm just about to make a, about to move some some gear into the new new house right now. So like I gotta pack up my studio and it's kind of a mess in there. So cool, man. 
Good hey, luck. So, yeah. Speaking of stuff going on, do you have any any last little thing you could tell us that you're you're doing next? I bet you're pretty busy with your house, but any uh, exciting upcoming future thing you could say to take us out? Um, I mean, not really. Just my the the end, just the end of the the season. I've got to head out to Midland. We've got a Disney show coming up. Um, got another concert with uh, Las Colinas up in May. Um, you know, every summer I play with, uh, there's a new music group in, uh, in Houston called, we call ourselves a Texas new music ensemble mm. kind of go down there. We have like a summer concert, uh, that we do. Um, so I get to, it's, it's pretty cool. It's a nice little <clears throat> ensemble that kind of keeps me, um, on my toes and things like that. It's like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do chamber works. Uh, what we first kind of started doing, uh, well, the, the the whole the whole mission behind the the group it was it started it was founded by, you know, a, a guy named um, his name is Chad Robinson, and we were we were all friends. That, oh, we all went to the University of Houston together, and then we all kind of branched out, did our own thing, and kind of came back. And it's you know he wanted to put together this ensemble together that that um, played music um, either by Texas composers. And, you know, all done by, you know, uh, Texas based or Texas uh, natives uh, perform performers. And so we all kind of came together and we started doing things. So like our first concert, we did like music from Don Grantham, um, uh, Rob Smith from U of H, uh, Pierre Jaubert from Rice. Wait, maybe, uh, Case, did you ever run into him while you were over there? The composer? Was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, uh, we played a couple of a couple of his works. Good stuff. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, amazing. Yeah, yeah, we did one of his works when we went to PASIC in 2006 at U of H. Um, he specifically says Jalbert. Is it Jalbert? Oh, man, well, okay. Well, you're I right, like the French, the French should be rounded at the end, but uh -huh. I think it's a coming to the States and, and you know, like a lot of families like Cangelosi, there's a lot of, and we say that very square, <laughs> it, could certainly, right. it could certainly have a little more ornamentation in there. But, you know, a lot of families moved to the U.S. and then they, they kind of dropped a lot of the isms with their with their names. So you'll have Jalbert versus Jalbert. Jalbert? Jalbert. Yeah. I can, I can get any of that. What's side. another Cangelosi pronunciation? Well, like people will tell you, like, like, you know, people will tell you it's not Bartok, it's Bartok. Yeah. It's like, no, so, it's not. That's like, that's like That's like saying it's Cangelosi versus... Cangelosi. It's like, no, it's not. It's Cangelosi. If you have an How about Italian... about Cangelosi? <laughs> right. It's like, if you have an Italian inflection, it's Cangelosi. It's, yeah, yeah, come on. You know, no, shut up. Yeah, it's like... <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm sure, and I'm sure it's not Stravinsky either. It's, it's, uh, there's, there's some extra noises in there. Oh, that, right. Right, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, of yeah, course sure. it's not bar talk. It's, it's as if we would grunting. say every word that is English specific in an English accent. Exactly. Or yeah, Scottish. No, exactly. Like, it's like, no, no, no it's not Glasgow. It's Glasgow. Or like, yeah. Right. Like, don't confuse not Ireland. The, it's Ireland. Right, like, don't confuse the, the pronunciation with the, the, the language that you, you, you speak, you know, the inflection that you yeah. have. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Tangent. <laughs> Cool. Well, you write some damn good music. Doesn't matter. I don't know. <laughs> Regardless yeah, of how you yeah. spell his last name, it's 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 pretty great. It's pretty incredible. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, and then and then this summer is well, we are we're Liz and I. That's when our, our wedding is. We we're getting married on June sixteenth. So congratulations. Ooh, that'll be Congrats. that's coming up. All of the planning is coming to a head now, and it's just a lot lot lots of stuff going on and. I'm just kind of get ready for the fall. And hopefully I can get, I need to get most of my analysis and research done for my DMA. I'm hoping to get all that done during the summertime. So just trying to graduate and, you know, press forward and, you know, see what the future holds, you know? Cool, man. Hey, well, it's really awesome catching up with you. And thanks so much for doing the show today. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It's not, it was good uh, to see you guys and to hear you, hear you talk and be part of the, uh, the conversation there. It's awesome. awesome. Awesome, awesome. Well, Brandon, Megan, Laurel, thank you guys so much. And we will catch everybody next time on episode 95, where our guest will be Beverly Johnston from Canada. So, Yay. cool. Looking to bed a little nice. bit. All right, guys. Take care. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Bye.